The date is October 20th, 2004. On this day, the first ever version of Ubuntu Linux was released. Whatever you think of Ubuntu nowadays, the immense impact that it has had on the Linux and open source community over the years is undeniable, and I think it's important to take a look back at the history of Ubuntu. From an easier to install Debian, to one of the most influential and controversial Linux distributions of all time, this is the Ubuntu story. Chapter 1 Origins The company behind Ubuntu, known as Canonical, was founded on March 5, 2004 by South African-British multi-millionaire entrepreneur Mark Shuttleworth. At just 25 years old, he sold his cryptographic certificate company, Thought Consulting, to VeriSign for $575 million US dollars. He would use this money to fund several projects including spending $20 million US dollars to go to the International Space Station as a tourist in 2002. Development of Ubuntu would begin with a small team of developers, and their goal was to create a high-quality and free operating system for human beings, from home users to large businesses. With these goals in mind, Canonical would release the first version of Ubuntu on October 20th, 2004. The first release of Ubuntu was version 4.10, named after the year and month that it was released. It was codenamed Warty Warthog due to it being the first released ever and being generally unpolished. Canonical made installation and live disks available as free downloads for 32 and 64-bit PCs, as well as PowerPC Macs. They would also ship you a professionally pressed Ubuntu CD for free as part of their Ship It program. Installation of Ubuntu 4.10 is simple, and includes a mostly automated display configurator and user account creation menu. The desktop is a slightly customized GNOME 2.8 with no less than 17 games installed by default. Firefox 0.9.3 and Evolution 2.0.2 were included as the web browser and mail client respectively, with the Microsoft Office compatible OpenOffice.org 1.1 included as well. While Ubuntu was already a lot more polished and easy to install than most distributions in 2004, this was just the beginning. Six months later, Ubuntu 5.04 was released with mostly incremental improvements. A brand new hardware database and update manager were added, along with a brand new theme and the installation process was further polished. Six months after that, 5.10 was released. Coming with an even more polished installation process, minimal server installs, a graphical boot screen, more documentation, and a graphical package manager that allows for easy installation of applications. But all of these changes would pale in comparison to what would come eight months later, and we'll learn more about that in the next section. Chapter 2, The GNOME 2 Era. On June 1, 2006, Canonical released Ubuntu 6.06, .06, which was codenamed Dapper Drake. This version was released two months late due to the amount of development that went into it and was still the only version of Ubuntu to ever be released late. This release would be a major step forward for Ubuntu, and was the first ever long-term support release, with the server version being supported until 2011 with security updates. The live and installation CDs would be unified into a single 700MB CD with both a live and installation environment, along with a much simpler to use graphical installer known as Ubiquity. The CD also included an auto-run launcher that runs when you insert it under Windows, which allows for the installation of popular open source applications such as Firefox. The OS itself includes an improved system theme, new icon theme, and new wallpapers, all showing the shift towards orange as the main accent color in Ubuntu instead of brown. It also finally reduced the number of games installed by default on Ubuntu by one, there's 16 now. This number will only go down from here. From 6.10 onwards, the numbering and naming scheme has remained consistent, with the numbers being the year and month the version is released in respectively. The code names were, and still are, an adjective followed by an animal with the same first letter, and are in sequential alphabetical order. For instance, Ubuntu 6.10 was named Edgy Eft and was released in October 2006, and Ubuntu 7.04 was named Feisty Fawn and was released in April of 2007. Every other April, there has been a long-term support release with three interim releases in between that focus is more on features than stability. The next four years of Ubuntu's development were filled with improvement. Ubuntu would lead the way as the easiest to set up and use out of any Linux distribution. 
Out of the box, Ubuntu came with easy to use graphical utilities for installing and removing software, updating your system, adding drivers, and most of the configuration options you can ask for without having to use the terminal. It was also free, contained no bloatware, and was faster than Windows in most cases. For this reason, many companies and schools started using Ubuntu, such as the school system in Andalusia, Spain, along with over 10,000 people who work at Google. In 2008, Wubai was released, which was a program that allowed for installing and uninstalling Ubuntu from within Windows. In 2009, Canonical released a cloud service and music store, known as Ubuntu One. Ubuntu One was designed for Ubuntu, but clients were also available for OS X, Windows, Android, and iOS. Later that same year, the Add Remove software tool, present since 2005, was finally replaced with the Ubuntu Software Center, an easy-to-use application similar to the Apple App Store. All of these changes and updates would culminate in the release of Ubuntu 10.04 LTS in April 2010. Ubuntu 10.04 would come with a brand new theme, known as Ambience, and would finally cut down on the number of pre-installed games significantly. It would also include desktop integration for Ubuntu 1. However, the new theme, as well as the fact that the window controls were moved from the top right to the top left of Windows, would draw some criticism from the Ubuntu community. This criticism, however, would be nothing in comparison to what would come a year later. Chapter 3, The First Taste of Controversy On April 6, 2011, version 3 of the GNOME desktop was released. GNOME 3 was a complete overhaul to the desktop, with it taking on a very minimalist and oversimplified design. Some people liked it, but most people didn't, with even Linus Torvalds himself stating that, quote, in GNOME 3, the developers have apparently decided that it's too complicated to do real work on your desktop, and have decided to make it really annoying to do. However, a year before GNOME 3 was even released, Canonical was already working on Project Ayatana, a project geared toward making Ubuntu easier to use. One major part of Ayatana was a replacement to the GNOME 2 desktop environment known as Unity. The Unity desktop environment debuted in Ubuntu Netbook Remix 10.10 and was added to mainline Ubuntu with version 11.04. Unity's interface somewhat resembles Mac OS, with an application panel on the left side of the screen and a launcher for applications known as the Dash on the top left corner. A global menu was also implemented at the top of the screen for Mac-like menus, but unlike Mac OS, it only showed up when you hovered over it. Initial reception was fairly poor, but by the time the 12.04 LTS version was released, reception was much better. However, just six months later, Ubuntu and Canonical experienced their biggest controversy yet. With the release of Ubuntu 12.10, Canonical integrated web search results, including results from Amazon.com, into their search feature. They also added an affiliate link to Amazon.com pinned to the Unity launcher by default. However, in order for the search feature to work, Ubuntu had to send data on all the user searches to Canonical and Amazon. A blogger would realize that this search feature was potentially in violation of the European Union's data protection laws. In 2014, a year after a formal complaint was filed against Canonical, the Information Commissioner's Office found that the feature, as implemented in Ubuntu 14.04, was not in violation of any laws. Amazon search integration would be disabled by default in Ubuntu 16.04, and in 2020, the useless and extremely dumb Amazon shortcut that had been pinned to the launcher for over seven years was finally permanently removed from Ubuntu. Chapter 4 the Unity era. With the exception of the Amazon search situation, after 2012 Unity was pretty well received by Linux users. Canonical wanted to turn Ubuntu into more than just a desktop operating system for PCs. At the time, Canonical was interested in convergence, or the concept of having tight integration between your desktop PC, phone, and even your smart TV, running the same operating system and applications, much like the Apple ecosystem. They were even interested in a single device that could act as your phone, computer, and smart TV, like Samsung DeX or what Microsoft was trying to do with Windows Phone. In order to achieve this goal, in 2011, they began development of the Ubuntu Phone operating system for mobile phones. Ubuntu Phone, later renamed Ubuntu Touch, used a gesture-based interface similar to what WebOS had at the time and what Android and iOS have now, with easy-to-access quick settings. Nautical also worked on a related project called Ubuntu for Android, which was where you could connect your Android phone to a monitor, keyboard, and mouse, and run desktop Ubuntu there, but it would run Android in your pocket. It would also allow you to make calls, texts, and run Android apps from your Ubuntu desktop. Both were demoed at CES 2013, and many popular tech YouTubers such as Marquez Brown Lee made videos about it at the time. In July of 2013, Canonical launched a crowdfunding campaign for the Ubuntu Edge, a cutting-edge phone meant to drive innovation in the market. 
However, it failed to reach its goal of 32 million US dollars, which at the time was the biggest crowdfunding campaign ever, only raising 12.7 million dollars. A year later, Ubuntu for Android, Wubuy, and the Ubuntu One cloud service would all be discontinued or cancelled by Canonical. The Ubuntu Touch operating system was sold with a few phone models in the EU and China in 2015 and 2016, but failed to catch on with a broader audience due to the lack of app support and brand recognition. Cancelled projects aside, from 2014 to 2017, Canonical was working hard on their new project known as Unity 8. Unity 8 development started around 2013, and was intended to replace the Unity 7 desktop environment by Ubuntu 16.04. Unity 8 would replace the X11 display server with Canonical's own Mir server, and would come with a much more modern theme and design. Due to it being a full rewrite from the ground up, development was time consuming, and it wouldn't be ready in time for the release of Ubuntu 16.04. However, 16.04 would come with a new package management system known as Snap by default, and would replace the custom Ubuntu Software Center with a slightly rebranded GNOME software. This will be important later. In Ubuntu 16.10 and 17.04, Unity 8 was available in the base distribution by changing the desktop environment on the login screen, but it was not enabled by default due to it being pretty buggy. However, Ubuntu 17.04 would be the last time Ubuntu would officially bundle any version of Unity. Chapter 5. A Sudden Change On April 5th, 2017, Mark Shuttleworth would post to the Canonical blog. In this post, Shuttleworth would announce that Canonical would be cancelling Ubuntu Touch, Unity 8, Unity 7, and Convergence to focus more on the IoT and server space. Ubuntu Server was, and still is, a huge success for Canonical, and is the most popular Linux distribution for web hosting. Ubuntu Core is very popular in the IoT space as well due to its small size and flexible hardware support. Canonical also provides professional support for these markets, which is a lot more profitable for them than providing support for a desktop operating system mainly used by tech-savvy people. Ubuntu 17.10 would be released in October that same year, with a GNOME 3.26 desktop environment with a few extensions to make it a bit more familiar to Ubuntu users. Development of Unity 8 and Ubuntu Touch was continued by the UbiPorts community, but as of the time of this video, Unity 8 is still not considered a stable desktop environment, six years after it was supposed to be shipped. Unity 7 continues to be developed by a small team, and they release the Ubuntu Unity distribution, an officially recognized and up-to-date derivative of Ubuntu with the Unity desktop environment pre-installed. Chapter 6, The GNOME 3 Era At first glance, the new GNOME desktop wasn't too different from Unity. However, many features from Unity did not make their way to GNOME. The Unity Dash, which included Universal Search, was replaced with the Mac-like GNOME Application Launcher with Application Search only. GNOME was, and still is, more resource-intensive than Unity, so people with an old or low-power computer experienced stuttering when opening the application menu and navigating around the desktop. The global menu was also removed, and the menu buttons were finally moved back to the right side of the application windows by default. Ubuntu 18.04 was the first long-term support release to ship GNOME as the default desktop environment. It was also the first Ubuntu release to ship two apps, the calculator and the system monitor, as snaps. Snaps are a new type of package intended originally for cloud computing that are typically sandboxed from the rest of the system and allow developers to directly compile the applications on their own computers. This allows for more up-to-date programs than what the Ubuntu repositories provide. These things provide an advantage for developers and an increase in security. However, snaps have many very notable downsides on the desktop, namely much worse desktop integration, larger download sizes, less flexibility, and slower start times. Snaps can also only be installed from Canonical's closed store Snap Store, unlike traditional Debian packages that can be installed from anywhere. These things have led snaps to be very controversial in the Linux community, especially on the desktop. Both systems coexisting and being used for essentially the same thing also resulted in many pieces of software being duplicated in the Ubuntu Software Center, causing confusion for me personally back in 2018 when I didn't know anything about Linux. Six months after Ubuntu 18.04, Ubuntu 18.10 was released featuring a brand new theme. This theme, known as Yaru, would be similar to the theme seen on Unity 8 prototypes. In Ubuntu 19.10, Canonical decided to deprecate the 32-bit libraries in their repositories. Users of Wine, Steam, and some audio software require the 32-bit libraries, however, so Canonical decided to support a few libraries, such as the ones required to run those legacy pieces of software, after a public backlash. In the same release, Ubuntu would change the Chromium package to be a stub that would install the Snap package of Chromium. This would be the first time that Ubuntu would completely replace a traditional package with a Snap. For the next two and a half years, Ubuntu would continue receiving regular updates, landing us to where we are now as of the making of this video. Chapter 7. Where does that leave us now? As of November 2022, the latest version of Ubuntu is version 22.10, codenamed Kinetic Kudu. 
The previous release, 22.04 LTS, shipped Firefox as a snap for the first time and made the traditional package into a stub. While modern Ubuntu is still pretty easy to install and set up, it lacks the emphasis on user experience that Ubuntu has had in the past. Even with all the changes to Snap making it better integrated on the desktop, the integration still isn't at the level of Debian packages. And Ubuntu's aging update manager does a pretty bad job at updating Snaps along with the system. And don't get me started on the Ubuntu software store. If you don't want these annoying notifications on Ubuntu 22.04, you have to use the terminal to update the software store. There's no way around it. Small user experience issues like this one are all too common in modern Ubuntu, and it's very clear that Canonical's priority is in the server and IoT spaces because that's where they make their money. This is understandable from a business perspective, especially with Canonical planning to make an initial public offering next year, but it's still disappointing as a Linux desktop user. Overall, it's undeniable what Ubuntu has done for the Linux desktop. It was, and still is, one of the easiest distributions to install. It has great hardware and community support, and it led the way in this regard. However, in the end, the company behind Ubuntu is just that, a company. And since the server and IoT spaces are much more profitable than the desktop space, Canonical chose to focus more on those spaces. Since the last video, I have gained over 100 subscribers, bringing me up to well over 500. I'd like to thank everyone who has subscribed to my channel and watched my videos over the past two months to get me to this milestone. A year ago, I was at 200 subscribers with no public videos on my channel, and I did not expect to come back to YouTube. Now, I have a small community of people that return to my videos, and I'd like to thank everyone who has subscribed, liked, and watched my videos over the past year. You guys are awesome. With all that being said, thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the future.